Egypt, land of the pyramids and pharaohs. One of the most studied and scrutinized civilizations of the ancient world, and yet it remains veiled in mystery. In this video, we are going to see that the Quran reveals secrets about Egypt that until recently were lost to mankind. Pharaoh was a tyrant in Egypt, enslaving and persecuting the children of Israel. The Quran states the following about the death of Pharaoh and his supporters. Note the words, heaven and earth wept not for them. A recently unearthed pyramid text has granted us new insights into the meaning of this verse. The pyramid text reads, the sky weeps for you, the earth weeps for you, when you ascend to heaven as a star. Here, the pyramid text praises Pharaoh, claiming that upon his death he will ascend through the sky and claim supremacy of the heavens by becoming a star. We can see that the Quran quotes the pyramid text directly in its rebuttal of Egyptian adulations of Pharaoh. What's amazing is that knowledge of the ancient Egyptian language of hieroglyphics was lost to mankind at the time the Quran was revealed. It wasn't until the discovery of an artifact known as the Rosetta Stone in the 18th century, over a thousand years after the revelation of the Quran, that mankind has been able to fully decode the hieroglyphics. When you hear the word Pharaoh, what comes into your mind? Most people think of the supreme ruler of Egypt. This is correct, but the word did not always refer to the supreme ruler. Ancient Egyptian history is divided into different periods. The word Pharaoh, Egyptian, Pera, had different meanings depending on the period of Egyptian history. Historically, the word Pharaoh only started being used as a title for the supreme ruler much later in Egyptian history, during the New Kingdom period. Before this, the word meant great house and was used to refer to the royal palace. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, Pharaoh, originally the royal palace in ancient Egypt. The word came to be used for the Egyptian king under the new kingdom. Let's now analyze the Quran's accounts about Egypt in light of these historical facts. Like the Bible, the Quran discusses the prophets Joseph and Moses, who both spent time in Egypt. Joseph is dated by scholars to either the Middle Kingdom or Second Intermediate Period, well before Pharaoh meant ruler. In the story of Joseph, the Quran repeatedly uses the word king to refer to the ruler of Egypt. He is never once called Pharaoh. Moses is dated by scholars to the New Kingdom period. In the story of Moses, the Quran repeatedly calls the ruler Pharaoh. He is never called king. We can see that the Quran is accurate in its use of language when it comes to describing the leader of Egypt at different periods in its history. How could the author of the Quran have known this? The only source of information about ancient Egypt that would have been readily available are the Bible-based stories. To claim that the Quran copied from the Bible is problematic because the Bible uses the word Pharaoh to refer to the Egyptian ruler in the story of Joseph, which is historically inaccurate. The Quran cannot have copied from the Bible because the Quran corrects the Bible. The Bible explicitly states that at the time of the Exodus, the Israelite men were vast in number. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. If we factor in the women and children, then the total number of Israelites would realistically be in the millions. This claim of a vast nation is problematic in light of other information that the Bible provides. Firstly, Pharaoh is said to have appointed two midwives to deliver and murder Israelite babies. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. 
two midwives would only be sufficient for such a task if the Israelites were small in number and giving birth to a manageable number of babies. Two midwives would not be sufficient for a vast nation of millions. <laughs> Secondly, the Bible tells us that after the Exodus, God informed Israel that they would not be granted the land of their enemies straight away. But I will not drive them out in a single year, because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you, until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Note the reason for the Israelites being denied immediate possession of the land. It is said that wild animals will overpower them. <laughs> Such a statement only makes sense if the Israelites were small in number and not a vast nation of millions as the Bible claims. By contrast, the Quran states that the Israelites were only a small band at the time of Moses. We can see that the Quran fixes the contradictions that are present in the biblical narrative. The Quran states that the punishment of crucifixion was used in ancient Egypt from the time of Moses all the way back to the time of Joseph. Now the word crucifixion typically brings to mind the Roman cross. However, in antiquity, there were different forms of crucifixion. Professor of archeology, span David Chapman wrote, In studying the ancient world, the scholar is wise not to differentiate too rigidly the categories of crucifixion, impalement, and suspension. Hence, any study of crucifixion conceptions in antiquity must grapple with the broader context of the wide variety of penal suspension of human beings. The Arabic words translated as crucified in the Quranic verses all contain the root word, solaba. Arabic dictionaries state that this root carries a number of meanings, including to harden or stiffen and to extract oily matter from bones. This word does not only mean death by being hung on a Roman cross. Rather, it indicates any method of execution which makes the body hardened or stiffened and results in the leaking of bodily fluids. So, impalement, suspension, and the Roman cross are all included without making any distinction. Archaeological evidence shows that the ancient Egyptians used to crucify people by impalement on a stake. The following entry is taken from an Egyptian German dictionary of hieroglyphics. Note the hieroglyph which depicts an impaled man. This is a punishment that was used throughout the different periods of ancient Egypt. The Abbot Papyrus is dated to the New Kingdom period. It mentions an oath that includes impalement. He took an oath on pain of being beaten and of being impaled. The earliest evidence for crucifixion by impalement is Papyrus Bulak 18, which is dated to the early second intermediate period. It states, A bloodbath had occurred with wood. The comrade was put on the stake. We can see that crucifixion by impalement on a stake was carried out during the New Kingdom period, and at least as far back as the second intermediate period. These time periods cover both Moses and Joseph, which shows that the Quran is historically accurate. As well as mentioning crucifixion, the Quran also narrates the following threat of mutilation made by the Pharaoh of Moses. Historically we know that capital punishment in ancient Egypt became more severe with the advent of the New Kingdom period, which is the time of Moses. In fact, the specific punishment of mutilation is primarily associated with the New Kingdom period. For example, the Turin Judicial Papyrus records, persons to whom was done punishment by severing their nose and ears on account of them ignoring the good instruction said to them. These details about crucifixion and mutilation are missing in the Bible. There is a Jewish commentary, the Midrash Shemot Rabbah, which mentions Pharaoh 
threatening Moses with burning and crucifixion. But this is a much later work that was composed centuries after the Quran was revealed. Neither the Bible nor Quran identifies the Pharaoh of Moses by name. We can use the details provided in the scriptures to try to identify the Pharaoh. Both scriptures speak of the Israelites being taken into slavery before the birth of Moses. The use of Semites for slave labour occurred only during the New Kingdom period. So, we can place Moses somewhere in the New Kingdom period. This gives us a list of 33 possible pharaohs. Both scriptures also speak of an exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. The Menepta Stele is an important artefact that contains the first explicit reference to Israel in the archaeological record. It is dated to around 1208 BCE. It discusses the land of Canaan and mentions the Israelites in relation to Canaan, indicating that the Exodus had already taken place by this date. The artefact is contemporaneous to the Pharaoh Menepta. This means that the Exodus had to take place before Menepta, since Menepta was alive and in power after the Exodus and not drowned in the sea. This establishes an upper boundary in the timeline of the pharaohs. From the point of view of both the Bible and Quran, we are now left with 18 pharaohs as candidates who may have ruled during the time of Moses. Let's now delve deeper into the biblical narrative. The Bible claims that there were two different pharaohs who were in power. The first died while Moses was in hiding in Midian. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The new Pharaoh continued his predecessor's persecution of the Israelites, and it was his second Pharaoh who was later drowned when Moses crossed the sea. The Bible gives us a timeline for these events. The burning bush encounter with God took place when Moses was 80 years old. So from his birth to the Exodus, there was a span of at least 80 years, during which two pharaohs ruled Egypt. Now, there is a big problem if we compare this biblical narrative to the timeline of the pharaohs. We've seen that the Bible claims exactly two pharaohs ruled during the 80-year period, from the birth of Moses to the Exodus. If we consider the number of years that each of the pharaohs ruled, we can see that there is no 80-year period during which only two pharaohs ruled. Any given 80-year period will give you at least three pharaohs in power. We can see that the biblical narrative contradicts the historical evidence. Let's now compare the Quranic narrative. Unlike the Bible, the Quran depicts a single pharaoh reigning from the birth of Moses all the way up to the Exodus. The Quran informs us that Moses fled to Midian when he reached the age of maturity. The Quran defines the age of maturity as 40 years old. The Quran also informs us that during his time in Midian, Moses spent eight to ten years in the service of his father-in-law before returning to Egypt to face Pharaoh. This means that Moses was at least 48 years of age when the Exodus happened. The only Pharaoh during the New Kingdom period who had such a lengthy reign as an absolute ruler was Ramesses II, who ruled for 66 years. The Quranic account is perfectly in line with the historical evidence and fixes the chronological issues that are present in the biblical narrative. Let's now compare the life and religion of Ramesses II to the claims that the Quran makes about the Pharaoh of Moses. <laughs> This claim that the Pharaoh of Moses was extravagant has been proven by archaeological discoveries, which show that Ramesses II was the grandest of the pharaohs. The archaeologist Peter Clayton wrote, His genuine building achievements are on a Herculean scale. The archaeologist Eric Uphill wrote, The palace of Ramesses was probably the vastest and most costly royal residence ever erected by the hand of man. The Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen wrote, Certainly, in his building works for the gods, 
Ramesses II surpassed not only the 18th dynasty, but every other period in Egyptian history. With regards to the religion of the Pharaoh of Moses, the Quran makes the following claim. The Quran states that the Pharaoh of Moses was arrogant, exalting himself to the position of God. Modern archaeological discoveries have proven this to be true. Ramesses II built the great temple at Abu Simbel to honour himself. Its entrance is flanked by four colossal statues of Ramesses II, which dwarf the statue of Ra Horakti, god of the horizon, located above it. This temple also contains an image of Ramesses II making a sacrifice to his divine self. The Quran makes the following claim about the Pharaoh of Moses, who God drowned in the sea. We can see that the Quran explicitly states that the Pharaoh's body will be preserved as a sign for future generations. Note that the Quran never makes such a statement about any of the other destroyed nations that it discusses, typically stating that their abandoned buildings and ruins have been made signs for later generations. This claim about a body being preserved is unique to the Pharaoh of Moses. The body of Ramesses II was discovered by archaeologists in the year 1881 CE. The mummy has been on display in the Cairo Museum, and over the last century, it has been seen by millions of tourists from all over the world. In the following documentary, Sir Tony Robinson states that Ramesses II is one of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Just across the river from Luxor lies the famous Valley of the Kings, where Ramesses himself was buried. His mummy was discovered in 1881. One of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Historically, priests had concealed his body in a secret location in the year 1000 BCE because of a problem with grave robbers. Nothing was known about his mummy in the intervening period of almost 3000 years. At the time the Quran was revealed, the whereabouts and fate of Pharaoh's body was unknown. During the 3000 year period in which the body was hidden, it could easily have been damaged or stolen. It may have even remained lost forever, locked away in its secret location, never to be rediscovered. If you think about it, these statements in the Quran are not only historically accurate, but also represent quite a bold prophecy. The Bible informs us about a series of plagues that God brought upon Egypt. The book of Exodus informs us that the first six of these plagues are as follows. First, the Nile was turned into blood. Second, masses of frogs. Third, swarms of mosquitoes. Fourth, swarms of flies. Fifth, the death of livestock. Sixth, boils on people and animals. Now at first glance, this series of plagues in the biblical narrative may seem random and unrelated. However, the Quran sheds light on these events. The Quran states the following about the divine punishments against Egypt. Notice the first punishment mentioned by the Quran, a flood. This is an important detail that is not found in the Bible. This punishment of a flood actually explains the six seemingly random and unrelated plagues in the biblical narrative. A flood would result in high concentrations of red earth entering the Nile River and causing a blood-like colour, killing fish and making the water undrinkable, as described in the biblical narrative. This phenomenon is attested to historically, as recorded by a Middle Kingdom Egyptian sage See, the river is blood, one shrinks from other people and thirsts for water. 
The rest of the biblical plagues are also easily explained as a consequence of the flood. Frogs, mentioned in plague number two, are known to fill the land after Nile floods. The death of the frogs recorded in the biblical narrative can be caused by contamination of anthrax that was carried over from the rotting fish. Mosquitoes, mentioned in plague number three, proliferate after Nile floods as the pools of water left over from the flooding would have allowed them to overbreed. Swarms of flies, mentioned in plague number four, would be brought about by the massive death of frogs on the land. The death of pasturing livestock, mentioned in plague number five, can be explained by anthrax, as brought on the land by the frogs. The boils on humans and cattle, mentioned in plague number six, may have been caused by bites. The stable fly in particular is infamous for its vicious biting of mammals. We can see that the Qur'an's mention of a flood easily explains the biblical plagues, which are not random as initially appears to be the case, but in fact a series of interrelated events. The Qur'an mentions the following incident about Joseph while he was in Egypt. Here the Qur'an states that Joseph was sold for a paltry price. The Arabic phrase used is darahima ma'dudatin, which contains the words dirham and ma'dud. Dirham means a unit of silver coinage or weight. Ma'dud means countable or limited in number. So the Qur'an is making the claim that Joseph was sold for a small amount of countable silver. There is plenty of historical evidence that standardized units of silver were used in transactions in ancient Egypt. Small pieces of silver, known as shati, were used in trade. The tomb of Nyanknum and Knumhotep is dated to the Old Kingdom period. It contains a scene of a busy open-air market with goods for sale. Cubits of cloth, for example, are said to be sold for six shati. The Rind mathematical papyrus is dated to the Second Intermediate Period. It discusses the relative values of gold, silver and lead in terms of shati. Small silver bars bearing the name of Pharaoh Tutankhamun have been dated to the New Kingdom period. They are inscribed with a hieroglyphic which states Tutankhamun, ruler of Heliopolis in Upper Egypt. Until recently, historians believed that the minting of precious metals was a later Greek invention. These recent Egyptian archaeological discoveries have forced historians to completely revise their understanding of coinage in the ancient world. How is it possible that such knowledge was revealed in the Qur'an nearly one and a half thousand years ago? The Bible mentions that Joseph was sold for 20 of silver. However, this sale is said to have taken place with some Arabs outside Egypt. By contrast, the Qur'an states that the sale took place inside Egypt. So, the Bible could not have been used as a source by the Qur'an. It is in fact the Bible that contains historical errors when it comes to coinage. For example, the Bible makes the claim that a gold coin known as the Darik was used at the time of King David. They gave toward the work on the Temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 Dariks of gold. As historians point out, the Darik is named after the Persian leader Darius the Great, who lived hundreds of years after King David. The Jewish Encyclopedia acknowledges this error. A notable instance of anachronism occurs in 1 Chronicles 29.7. Gold Dariks, coins which were not struck before the time of King Darius I, i.e. more than 400 years after David. The Quran narrates the following conversation between the Pharaoh of Moses and an individual referred to as Haman. <laughs> he 
Here Pharaoh commanded Haman to build a tower that would allow him to reach the heavens. It's important to understand that Pharaoh's intention was not to literally scale a tower to reach the sky. Rather, it's a reference to the Egyptian belief that after death, the Pharaoh would ascend from earth to heaven, taking his place among the gods. As we covered earlier, the author of the Quran had an awareness of ancient pyramid texts that detailed such beliefs. Egyptian monuments housed the bodies of dead pharaohs. These monuments acted as a bridge between this world and the next. They were filled with religious writings that served as instructions to help the dead pharaoh ascend to the heavens. Hence, the person in charge of constructing such a monument for pharaoh would not only need to be skilled in architecture, but also highly knowledgeable in religion, a builder priest of sorts. Let's now turn to history to see if we can identify an individual known as Haman, who was both a builder and a priest. Earlier we concluded that Ramesses II was the pharaoh at the time of Moses, so we will focus on this time period. A block statue in the Egyptian Museum of Munich contains a biographical account of the life of a high priest named Baken Khonsu. In his own words he states, I am one truly reliable, useful to his Lord, who performs beneficent deeds within his temple, I being principal chief of works in the estate of Amun. I erected obelisks of granite stone whose tops reach to the sky. Here, Baken Khonsu tells us that he served the Pharaoh in two ways, first by performing rituals in the temple and second as chief architect. In fact, Baken Khonsu was an architect extraordinaire, being one of the greatest in all of ancient Egypt. He is responsible for constructing the Temple of Amun at Karnak, a monument that remains one of the largest religious structures ever created by man. With regards to the priesthood, Baken Khonsu informs us that he had a very long and illustrious career. I was a third prophet of Amun for 15 years. I was a second prophet of Amun for 12 years. He appointed me high priest of Amun for 27 years. Here Baken Khonsu is stating that he served the god Amun throughout his priestly career. Amun is the name of an Egyptian deity who rose to prominence during the New Kingdom period. By the time Baken Khonsu died, he had been a priest for many decades, having served Ramesses II as high priest throughout his reign. Both Ramesses II and Baken Khonsu were contemporaries who died around the same time. What about the Qur'an's mention of Haman? How does it relate to Bakin Khonsu? Bakin Khonsu referred to himself by the title High Priest of Amun. The actual phrase in the hieroglyphics is Ham Nata Tapi Amana. The word Ham literally means servant and Amana is how you articulate the name of the god Amun in Egyptian. Bakin Khonsu was Ham Amana meaning servant of Amun. The Qur'an's mention of Haman may be simply an Arabized version of the Egyptian Hamamana. Let's now summarize the main points about Bakin Khonsu. He was a senior ranking figure under Pharaoh Ramesses II, acting as both high priest and chief architect. He served in the temple of the god Amun and thus had the title Hamamana. It is clear that all of the historical evidence fits perfectly with the Qur'anic narrative. Now it's important to point out that the Bible also mentions a Haman, but the resemblance is only in name. The biblical Haman served under a Persian king and bears no relation to the Qur'anic Haman of Egypt. Yet again, these are details that are completely missing in the biblical narrative. In this video we have seen that the Qur'an has a remarkable insight into many facets of ancient Egypt, revealing long-lost knowledge while also correcting the Bible. Claims that the author of the Qur'an copied from the Bible are clearly rubbished in light of such facts. The Qur'an boldly declares its origins. To learn more about the miracles of the Qur'an, 
please download your free copy of the book, The Eternal Challenge, at the link below.